but we have done lots of work on different aspects of the project. It's had a few different subtitles for different purposes, but the one that I like is Early English Bread Making and Meaning, because that kind of describes the division of labour um, in the project. So I'm mainly responsible for bread as a physical substance, object, and Martha is mainly responsible for the ideas surrounding the physical object. There have been one or two demarcation disputes, but that's the main division of labour. Um, and a lot of different things have kind of spun off this, um, this project. I've got a big project on the mechanisation of milling in England, which has got completely out of hand, but I'm not talking about that tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, gender and status and food production, I put in my title, but it's actually focused on bread. Um, and this is, so these are two different papers that we've produced independently, even though they're both part of the project. So I'm going to share my screen now. You can see my PowerPoint. <laughs> there we go. So there's my title. <laughs> So a bit of background on this paper, um, in 2018 I was invited to contribute to a volume of essays to celebrate Athelflaed of Mercia. So, um, there we go, that's Athelflaed of Mercia's um, family tree, so you can see she's um, related to some important people, and she was indeed an important person herself. She was basically the only female ruler in early medieval England who we actually know anything about. She died in 918, as you can see, and we don't know when she was born, so this was going to be the only significant anniversary of her lifetime that was going to happen during my lifetime. So I really wanted to be involved in this volume, but I had a problem deciding what to talk about because I don't work on high status people. I work on the vast majority of the population who actually work for a living and normally don't even get named in written sources, let alone any other information. So that seemed to be a problem, but then I hit on a way in, which was via Athelflaed's title, The Lady of the Mercians. She's one of only three women who are dignified by the title lady in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And the other two are the 11th century queens, Edith and Emma. So very high status people. And she's the only one who has a whole set of annals devoted to her exploits, the so-called Mercian Register or Annals of Athelflaed. And it's there that she's described in Old English as Mirkna Flavdia, Lady of the Mercians. So let's have a look at that title. So Old English Hlavdia, perhaps surprisingly, etymologically means a kneader of bread. The first element is hlaf, bread, which gives us loaf in modern English, and that's a very common word in Old English, as you might expect. The second element, though, the d of it, is much less common. Uh, it's a version of dia in Old English, a female servant, and probably originally a kneader. There's an Old Norse um, cognate, as you can see, and it's also related to uh, words like dough, 
dach in Old English and digitus, a finger in Latin, that one doesn't seem to have got into Germanic languages. And it's Latinized as dia, D-A-I-A, -A, in Doomsday Book. And there, the dia is somebody concerned with dairy products. And in fact, the word dairy comes from the Latin dia. But it looks as if originally her job was to do with bread. And there is, in fact, a gloss, this is later on in the 11th century, where Dyer glosses um, a kind of version of the Latin word for a female baker, pistrix. The spelling's not great, but I'm pretty sure that is the word. So that's the feminine version of the masculine pistor, a baker. So that's the Flavdia, the lady. Also, her male equivalent, the Lord, Flavord, is etymologically a bread guardian, Flav plus word in Old English. So both these terms of authority seem to belong in a domestic context where the father figure controlled the food supply and the female authority figure apparently made the bread herself. Now it is hard to imagine the most famous ladies of early medieval England like Athelflaed herself or Emma of Normandy actually physically making their own bread and in fact their households must have been big enough to require a kind of semi-industrial scale of production probably with specialist workers. But the members of those households would expect their lady to provide them with food. What they probably wouldn't expect would be that she would bake bread herself for them. They wouldn't take titles like Klavdia literally, probably, but they must have been aware of their etymological implications. So what did Old English speakers understand by this term? Well, there's no doubt that turning cereal crops into bread was associated with women in early medieval England and more widely in traditional societies. There's a well-known passage in the law code of Athelbert of Kent. I mean, well-known among people who work on this period. I don't suppose everybody in the audience has heard of it. Um, but, um, What's normally um, thought to make this important is that it gives us a kind of structure of three levels of female slaves, at least for the king's slaves and the commoners' servants. So I'm guessing for the noblemen's as well, although the money doesn't quite work. Uh, but from our point of view, the important thing is that the middle rank of slave in the king's household is a grinding slave. So I think that probably there were three levels, even if this is a bit too systematic for real life, but there were in theory at least three levels of slave, probably in everybody's household, and the middle one probably did the grinding as well. The top rank would probably involve skilled textile workers and household servants. And I'm sure the third was agricultural laborers. So the grinding slave would come between those. Um, her work was more physically demanding and dirtier than textile crafts or housework, but less so than working on the land, which would also, of course, involve being outside in all weathers. Grinding was certainly heavy labour, nevertheless, and if you wonder how I know that, here you are. Um, and yeah, I'm, I managed this for about 10 minutes and produced about a handful <laughs> of very coarse meal, which was going to need to be ground again before anybody could use it for anything. So I do know that this is very hard work. And it would have demanded a lot of woman power at all levels of Kentish society. 
Now, Kent was only one of several kingdoms in England in the 7th century, but it is likely that similar arrangements existed right across England. Um, as I say, this association between grinding by hand and low status women is very widespread. When Aldhelm, Bishop of Sherborne, wrote his Enigmata Aura riddles, good thing about Aldhelm's riddles is he gives you the answer at the beginning, um, but when he, he wrote these, so number is 66, um, a mill or millstones is definitely about grinding by hand and he equates the two millstones with sisters working together and he doesn't make it explicit but I would say these sisters reflect the common pattern of two women working together to turn the quern as in the biblical two grinding in a mill. It wasn't only the production of flour that was in female hands in early medieval England. The kneading of the dough too seems to have been a woman's task. To judge by the infamous Old English dough riddle from the Exeter book around the end of the 10th century. I'm just giving you a minute to read that. <laughs> Now, in the highly heteronormative conditions of the early Middle Ages, a female protagonist is clearly required by the more obvious solution to the riddle. But the concealed correct solution wouldn't work if a woman's involvement in bread making was implausible to, for the audience. So this, this riddle reinforces the association of women with kneading bread that we've already seen in the title of Havdia. So there's a strong connection between bread making and female gender. When it comes to the actual baking though, it's possible that at least sometimes this was done by people other than women. The great educator Alfrich of Ancham, for example, um, around the year 1000, wrote a colloquy to help monastic pupils with their Latin, and he only has male workers in this. It includes a pistor, masculine Latin noun for a baker, and is glossed with Old English bakera. Old English masculine noun for a baker. And in early Northumbria too, we hear of monks working as bakers. But monasteries weren't the, uh, the whole of society, obviously. These were all male institutions and many tasks were undoubtedly undertaken there uh, with, by men, which would be women's work in the outside world. In his grammar and glossary, Alfrich actually translates the masculine noun pistor by the Old English feminine noun backstra, uh, which gives rise to the surname Baxter. There's actually quite a lot of surnames which relate to female agent nouns in Old English, so Baxter and Webster and Brewster and so on. So that's the feminine equivalent to Baker in Old English. So the existence of this noun presumably means that female bakers also existed in real life. Alfrich or his scribe must have made a slip, substituting the female term, which might have been more familiar for the masculine one. So the implication is that female bakers were a common phenomenon in early medieval England, even if they weren't the only people who baked. So that's gender. Now let's have a look at status. There's no doubt that making bread seems an unlikely activity for a woman at the top of society, as we've already seen. Um, and we've seen that the production of flour was associated with women at the bottom of society. 
The actual making of bread, though, does seem to have less humble associations. Um, as we saw in the Exeter book riddle, there it's a lord's daughter who grasps the boneless thing and gives rise to the double entendre on which the whole thing depends. Uh, and even allowing for the tendency of old English first to exaggerate characters' social status, evidently it was plausible for a woman whose father was a lord to be in involved in bread production. I don't think early medieval writers were simply blinded to status by gender. Clearly all women did have a lot in common, both biologically and in terms of social expectations, but their social position and inequalities of wealth would have made a lot of difference to their lives. So this is uh, recognised in this anomalous homily, which I was actually able to say, um, from the 10th century, where the homilist um, is clearly only mixing with women who have a very nice life. They're always inside. They don't work at anything heavy. They take baths all the time, rub themselves with, well, it sounds good, doesn't it? Um, but the homilist tells us that we also have to think about women who work at servile and heavy work. And you'll know that they're healthier and more vigorous than men who live in idleness. So this doesn't really take account of the potential ill effects on health of heavy physical labour and being out in all weathers, but clearly the, the homilist is aware that social status and wealth make a difference to women's lives. So there seems to be a contradiction between the association we've seen between high status women and a basic food production process, in fact, very heavy labor. But to some extent, we can resolve that by greater precision. So the Old English Hlavdia is actually quite specific. It refers to kneading specifically rather than more generally making bread. Uh, the Exeter riddle again associates the Lord's daughter with that same stage of bread making. So maybe it's only the kneading of the fermenting dough that was considered appropriate for women of high status and all other parts of the process carried out by people of lower social groups. Okay, so what's special about kneading? Well, it's only necessary for certain kinds of bread and because it involves extra work, it's likely to be thought worthwhile mainly for kinds of bread that are considered particularly desirable. In medieval Europe, it was white bread that was considered most desirable, as it was until very recently. So white bread was the kind that was so attractive to two kings of Essex in the seventh century that they demanded it from Bishop Melitus. So you can see here, when they saw the bishop give the Eucharist to the people, uh, they said, why do you not offer us too the white bread which you used to give to our father and you haven't stopped giving it to the people in church? Uh, but it wasn't quite so attractive that they were prepared to embrace Christianity in order to gain access to it. So, in fact, when the, uh, the bishop said they had to be baptised, they kicked him out of their kingdom instead. And white bread was also recommended by the medical authorities of the time. Um, this is Anthemus in the 6th century, he didn't actually come to England, but he was originally a Byzantine envoy, so he was from, very much from a, Med, uh, a Mediterranean culture. Um, and he f finished up in Francia, which, where he was very shocked to find them eating bacon, but he also advised them on what kind of bread they ought to eat. And as you can see, it's got to be white and well risen, otherwise it weighs down your stomach. So white bread clearly 
was the top kind of bread in the early Middle Ages, but bread that looks white by modern standards was far in the future at this time, as this can only be achieved by bleaching the flour, and there's some comparative examples for you. Before bleaching became possible, flour would have to be sieved repeatedly and probably bolted through cloth to remove the darker coloured particles and get the whitest spread that was possible at the time. Without bleaching, the whitest flour is made from bread wheat. So this is the kind of wheat that all bread's made of now, or virtually all bread, um, and is known botanically as Triticum Eastivum, Eastivum group. So flour from other kinds of um, cereals, if, uh, if it's not bleached, they all look greyish or brownish by comparison. And bread wheat also has another advantage in bread wheat making, namely its high level of elastic gluten, which means that it rises more than bread made from any other kind of cereal. So this is definitely what Anthemus was recommending in his De Observazione. And white wheat bread rises most of all, but to maximize that effect, if you just mix it up, you don't get that effect. To maximize that effect, the baker needs to develop the gluten by kneading vigorously. So what makes kneading so special is that it's necessary to make a well-risen white loaf from bread wheat, the whitest and best risen kind of bread that was available in the early Middle Ages, and in fact, is today. When this white bread first became available in England, probably following the conversion to Christianity, its production may have been such a prestigious task that it was only carried out by people right at the top of the social scale. The flour to make it was produced by slaves and may have been sieved by slaves or servants, but the output of these processes would have been very small in proportion to the labour involved, making the flour a very high value product. The actual kneading that that almost magical process that transforms the precious flour into a living, moving entity and ultimately into the kind of bread that discerning consumers were increasingly demanding, might therefore not be entrusted to low status women. They might be tempted to eat the bread themselves or steal the flour to make their own. It would be much safer for the slavdia, the lady, to do the job herself and perhaps the transformation effected was so impressive that some special powers were attributed to the person who brought it about. So that very few women were distinguished by the title lady. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Debbie. I, um, I can't find the um, unmute everyone button, but um, everyone, I'm sure, would love to give you a round of applause. And uh, thank you very much. You can also be on various videos um, and hear from a few people. Um, that was fascinating um, and interesting. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. There's a couple already um, in the chat, um, which we'll talk about shortly. So moving swiftly on um, to our next speaker, um, we are very lucky to have um, Martha Bayliss from University of Oregon. Um, Martha is a professor of English and the director of the Folklore and Public Culture Program um, at Oregon. Um, she's published broadly in medieval literature um, and culture, and today she's going to talk to us about dangerous bread, um, women, bread, and the supernatural. I'm just going to unmute Martha. Yes. Thank you. Um... Let me get my screen up. There, I hope someone will say if that's not working. Um, that's right. Great. Um, so, uh, so I'm talking about the meanings of bread. Um, 
And since early medieval England was founded on bread, uh, it's unsurprising that supernatural practices became entwined with bread. And it's also unsurprising, as we've seen, that uh, the production of it became gendered, and so it's unsurprising that magic became gendered as well. So today I'm going to discuss the stories and accounts that reveal how people thought about bread and about how bread was tied in to divisions of gender, even in the supernatural. And since our project, the Early English Bread Project, looks at bread in England before 1200, I'm going to stick to early medieval bread in Western Europe, though I have some cause to stray outside the period. And I should also warn everybody that at a certain point, the magic gets obscene. So um, brace yourselves, be willing to put the mute on at a moment's notice. So at this period before 1200, the story of men and bread is the story of miracles. When men and women show up in these accounts, um, the men are virtuous and spiritual. They are served bread and they receive holy bread. The women are skeptical and bodily. The women cook and serve the bread. And when they make bread, they make diabolical bread. So I'll start with the stories of miraculous holy bread. And one example is a famous uh, miracle of the woman who doubted the Eucharist. Um, and I hope you can see that over, I hope that you have to, may have to take part of your screen up um, to see the, the translation. This is the famous miracle um, that supposedly happened in a mass conducted by Pope Gregory the Great who lived in the 6th century, but the legend first appears in the early 8th century in the Whitby Life of Gregory. So it says, for an old story tells that once a matron of Rome making her offerings, in other words, bringing her bread to be made into um, the communion host, had brought them to him, which the holy man receiving them then consecrated into the body of the most holy Christ, the victim. When she came to take communion from the hand of the man of God, and heard him say, may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve your soul, she smiled. And I should add, this is presumably not a smile of joy with anticipated union with the divine, but a kind of sarcastic and skeptical smile. So when the man of the Lord saw this, he closed his hand against her mouth. When the mass was finished, calling her to him, he asked why she had smiled when it was time to take communion. She answered, I myself made those items of bread with my own hands, and you said they were the body of the Lord. So in response to this blasphemous skepticism, Gregory starts to pray, and the host is miraculously transformed into the shape of a finger, and the woman is converted into belief in transubstantiation. And I always think it's lucky that it's a finger that the bread is transformed into, because a finger is so easily identifiable whereas a random chunk of leg would not be so identifiable. Nevertheless, when it's depicted in paintings, um, which my thing does not want to advance. Now, why is that? So I have a lovely painting. There we go. Um, the painting on the left is the same miracle, but you see that it's, transformed into a little figure of Christ. Um, because I think just a finger in a painting would look weird and uh, maybe even laughable. So usually when they depict it in paintings, um, it's, a, it's a little figure instead of a finger. But in the text, it's always a finger. And incidentally, this communion wafer is supposed to be preserved in this shrine in Andex in Bavaria. And of course, as a bread historian, I want to get in there and analyze what kind of grains it's made of, but I suppose that would be sacrilegious. Anyway, this story of the sinfully skeptical bread-making matron appears in a great number of later texts from all points in the Middle Ages, which I've listed here on the right, as well as in many, many paintings. And as time passed, the woman became excluded from the picture as you can see in this 15th century image of the same miracle, and there's no woman in there at all, it becomes a deacon who's made the bread and who's skeptical. 
And this is partly because somewhere around the 10th century, regular women stopped making the bread for the mass and the deacons or other church personnel were supposed to make it. But the rules say that only deacons of good character. So that women were taken out of the picture, both literally and figuratively. Anyway, this episode exemplifies the paradigm of women's relationship to bread. Women were responsible for producing bread, even the bread used in communion in our period, but it never gives them authority. Instead, it shows them as deficient in understanding. If it can be said that bread reveals a person's true nature, bread demonstrates that women's nature is limited and only imperfectly spiritual. While women were the suppliers of bread, it's the male priest in the story who is important. He's the medium for the transcends substantiation and the instrument of the revelation of divine truth. There are many, many other stories that feature bread miracles, and we can see a pattern in them. Here's five of them. The pattern is that bread is provided, but women are extraneous to the process, unlike bread in real life. So in the first story, this is from the dialogues of Gregory the Great, a priest is in charge of rebuilding a church, but there's a bread shortage and his workmen are too faint to work. But the priest looks in a communal oven and finds a miraculously white loaf, which sustains the workmen for 10 days. But all of the local women say, no, we didn't make it. So that's how you know it's a miraculous loaf of bread. In the second one, in the life of St. Anselm, the boy Anselm has a vision in which he's instructed to climb a mountain to the court of God. And on the way, he sees women reaping the crops, but carelessly and idly. When Anselm reaches the top of his climb, a steward appears. I'm not sure what kind of a steward they have at the top of a mountain, but it's basically an angel who brings the boy the whitest of bread. So the women are working and Anselm is mountain climbing, but Anselm gets the bread. The only point of the women being in the story is that they're not weeping uh, diligently enough. In another story, the third one, an angel serves St. Cuthbert some miraculously white bread. No women need to be involved. In the fifth one, King Alfred offers half of his sole remaining loaf to a mysterious stranger, and it turns out to be the ghost of St. Cuthbert. And then St. Cuthbert ensures that the bread remains miraculously undiminished. And in the uh, lower one, Jerome's Life of St. Paul tells the story of Paul and Antony in the desert who were brought bread by a raven, which gave the saints an opportunity to perform humility by each insisting that the other take the first piece of bread. That was so popular that it, there's a depiction of it on the Rothwell cross. So notice that in these latter two stories, King Alfred and Paul and Antony, basically for a man to offer bread to someone else constitutes a miracle. In only one of the stories is the man who eats bread at fault. And this is the story of the treacherous Godwin, uh, which first appeared in William of Malmesbury's uh, Gesta Regum Anglorum of the early 12th century. And then it's in four subsequent texts. So the evil Godwin is sitting at dinner with the king when he denies that he's acted against the interests of the king, swearing that if he's false, God forbid that I should swallow this morsel. And then he chokes to death on his piece of bread. That little picture is him just about to eat the piece of bread. This forms a spontaneous secular instance of the corsnad, the ordeal of bread, in which bread is deliberately fed to a suspect, perhaps always a cleric, not clear, to test whether God will choke him to death. Although this is a rare example of a man who was not worthy of the bread he was served, it's noteworthy that even so, he retains the male position, the position of eating rather than serving. Where consuming the bread is a male realm, the preparation of the bread is women's realm, and where there are women in stories, sex tends to creep in. Here's a picture that's not from our period, but I think it shows the, what I'm talking about. This is a late medieval image. Um, but this woman does not need to wear a bright red dress that um, I don't even know how to describe how that dress is uh, on her, but I, I hope you see what I mean. Um, it's, it's skin tight in a rather conspicuous way, and she does not need to wear that in order to make some flatbread over the fire. 
but wherever there's women, people start thinking, you know, the male people who are making the pictures or the stories start thinking of other things. So bred sexuality and problematic magic of women intersect most dramatically in the decretum of Burkhard of Worms of the early 11th century. There he is. Many of uh, his items witness entirely plausible magical practices of the time, such as collecting herbs while, or herbs while uttering charms or making offerings at trees or springs. But he also lists a number of things that he disapproves of that look more like the products of a, of a cleric's fevered imagination. And we can observe that Burkhard was particularly interested in magic that involved women's naked bodies. Burkhard describes several practices in which women allegedly tried to achieve power over their husbands by food magic. In the first, Burkhard describes a ritual to inflame the desire of husbands. He says, have you done as certain women are accustomed to do? They lie down on their face and with their buttocks uncovered, they order that bread should be made upon their nude buttocks. And having cooked it, they give it to their husbands to eat. They do so, this they do so that they should burn more greatly with love for them. So it's worth noting here that the men burning with love for their wives is supposed to be immoral and wrong, even within marriage, and that sexual desire is portrayed as something created by women rather than inherent in men. In a sense, bread and women are both objects presented to be consumed by men. This is not the only example in which food is equated to women's sexuality. There's also a ritual involving a fish, and this is where those of delicate sensibilities might want to start bracing themselves. So Burkhardt says, have you done what some women are accustomed to do? They take a living fish and put it in their childbirth parts and keep it there until such time as it is dead and cook or roast the fish and give it to their husbands to eat so that by doing so, they will burn with greater love for them. Burkhardt's descriptions made their way into the Arundel Penitential copied in England in the 10th or 11th century. And this expands on these a little bit. It says uh, a woman is, is wrong if she gives a fish that died in her childbirth parts or bread made on her buttocks or menstrual blood to her husband to eat or drink, she should do severe penance for five years. Again, the ritual suggests that the food and the sexuality of the women are linked, both involving the appetites of the man. And these motifs appear further in the work of William de Montebus, a theologian at Lincoln Cathedral who died in 1213. And he repeated the charge, advising penance, if a woman has given either a fish which has died in her vagina or bread which is made on her buttocks with blood or menstrual blood to her husband to eat or drink, so that his love will be more inflamed. And here the tradition has become garbled. So there's bread, the, the blood has been added to the process of the bread, which makes it even more implausible, as well as more closely associated with the feminine. And this bread made with blood is almost a corrupt inversion of the association of bread and blood in the Eucharist, where the Eucharist promises purification the blood of women in domestic magic rituals poses the threat of contaminating sexuality. So this forms a contrast to a list of portents accompanying the birth of Christ. As described in the Old English Martyrology, one of these portents was that in one country, when they broke their bread at the meal, then blood flowed out of the bread as it does from the body of a man when he is wounded. And as you can see at the bottom, this traveled around from text to text, this portent. But what it shows is the association of bread and blood was always supernatural. It was divine when it was associated with the male godhead, but when it was associated with the hands of women, it was diabolical. One might speculate that Burkhard's association between bread making and women's buttocks was merely the result of conceptual associations or indeed of wishful thinking. But it's worth noting that reports of the tradition of buttock spread appear in several later sources. In the late 17th century, John Aubrey reports a playful version 
And he says, young wenches have a wanton sport, which they call molding of cockle bread, viz they get upon a table board and then gather up their knees and their coats with their hands as high as they can. And then they wobble to and fro with their buttocks as if they were kneading of dough with their mm, and say these words, viz, my dame is sick and gone to bed and I'll go mold my cockle bread. In Oxfordshire, the maids, when they have put themselves into the fit posture, say thus, my granny is sick and now is dead and will go mold some cockle bread up with my heels and down with my head. And this is the way to mold cockle bread. The practice seems to involve a gleeful ribaldry, but also the overturning of authority with the dame or the granny out of the picture. The reveler is free to express her own sexuality. And this eventually um, evolves into a children's game, which is still known. It's widespread throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And basically it it's involves turning upside down. Um, Although the early modern practice seems much more playful than that depicted by Burkhard, the men recording it remain aghast. And I should also say that I have some theories about why it's called cockle bread, but um, fortunately, we don't have enough time for me to expound on that part. Um, remarkably enough, Aubrey also collected a descendant of the second practice described by Burkhard, and he says, an old filthy rhythm used by base people, viz. When I was a young maid and washed my mother's dishes, I put my finger in my mm and plucked out little fishes. The association between bread, women's bodies, and women's magic is also evident in Burkhard's account of an even more sensational practice. This aimed not to inflame husbands, but to bring about their deaths. So he says, have you done what some women are accustomed to do? They take off their clothes and smear their naked body with honey, and thus with honey on their body, they roll themselves this way and that over wheat spread on a cloth on the ground. Then they carefully collect all the grains of wheat that stick to their damp body and put them into a mill and turn the mill in the opposite direction from the sun and so reduce it to flour and make bread from that flour. And so they give it to their husbands to eat so that when they have eaten that bread, they will wither away and die. I, I really doubt that this happened because it would be so sticky. I don't think you could actually mill that, but we, um, we have not actually done any firsthand testing of this theory. Anyway, so bread is connected to matters of life and death in much the same way as female sexuality. So, I mean, why should magically poisonous bread involve rolling around naked? It's as if women's sexuality itself is poisonous, but not so poisonous that all the penitential writers don't like to imagine it. Finally, it's also distinctive that in all of these accounts in which women are mentioned, and nearly all early medieval bread miracles with a single exception, women are errant. It's as if they only appear in narrative when they have transgressed. A good woman is a woman who does not appear in the story. And in all of these stories, it is when the women are alone with no men to correct or oversee them that they get up to the worst mischief. Cooking and baking offered just such an opportunity. And since women baked bread all the time, their risk of sporting with the forces of supernatural evil were ongoing. Nevertheless, they did keep baking and they did keep disporting and an echo of their cheerful determination can perhaps be heard down the ages. My dame is sick and gone to bed and I'll go mold my cockle bread. Thank you. Round of applause. Um, Martha, thank you so much um, for your paper. Um, those are both so wonderful to hear together. Um, obviously you've worked together in this project and as a pair of um, papers, of course you plan this, but they interconnect kind of so well and I, they do that thing I love about um, kind of very good food history and that they are talking about bread, but they are of course about so many other things um, and they use such a wonderful um, diversity of material as well and um, kind of gain access to some of those practices. 